It's a, quite a striking story and sequence. And uh, in, the, in psychiatry, we often think about how our field would be if people in society approach mental health with the kind of attention and support they provide for people with cancer, not to pit one against the other. But it's quite remarkable uh, to hear this uh, story, and uh, so glad that you can share it with us. Um, we have uh, a reminder, if you have questions, please raise your hand. One of our volunteers will collect them and bring them to me. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Ariel Berger, uh, uh, who uh, didn't know when she joined our organizing committee that she was actually going to be uh, on the panel speaking, uh, but has an interesting and compelling story to talk about another area uh, perinatal uh, concern that has to do uh, with uh, pregnancy loss. Uh, Ariel Berger is a geriatrician. Uh, she works at the University Health Network and outside our hospital. And her, her professional work focuses on optimizing function and quality of life in older adults. She's a lecturer in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and active in mentoring and teaching medical trainees. Ariel is married to Daniel Held, and together they have two young, beautiful daughters at home who keep them on their toes. Uh, Ariel, why not this? Sakita Azrini Simcha. 
You have turned my sorrow into dancing. You have removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, forever I will thank you. And I just remember after like over 36 hours of labor, that was very much how I felt. <laughs> that my sorrow was turned into joy, and I just loved that song. And I was sitting there in my living room in those days, and I remembered my teacher, um, Rabbi Avi Weiss, speaking about how this song really represents the fragility of life and the impermanence of our station in life, and that's what this, was, this song was about. And I looked at it again, and I saw these lines of, um, so in English, at night there may be weeping, but in the morning there's joy, like it can just switch in an instant. And the same thing can go the other way. When I, it says, when I felt secure, I said, I shall never be shaken. And that felt like what happened. The fact that this baby could die never for a second crossed my mind. It was such a shock. And I just, I felt like this came out of the blue, and I just prayed every single day, just get me out of here. Like, I don't know how I got here, but you've got to get me out. And I, I took great comfort in just imagining the centuries of people saying those words, and the, like, just the stark reality of those words and how true they felt. Um, and so I felt that in those days, prayer was very helpful for me. The next thing I wanted to speak about was um, ritual. So I think one of the things that was very hard about this experience was actually the lack of any ritual. Like, there was just nothing. And if I think of so many other life cycle events in our community, it's filled with stuff you have to do. Like our wedding, it was just like, we spent hours and hours planning like every single step up to the chuppah. And you know, when someone dies, it's like every hour is prescribed what you have to do. And when a child dies before 30 days of life, there's nothing. There's no mourning, there's no formal burial, there's no prayers to say. And it just made me feel like this doesn't matter. Like I just, this. I have this like huge pain inside of me, but it's nothing. Nobody cares, nobody knows what to say, there's no name for it, and, and that was very, very difficult. Um, but after a few weeks, um, it became close to time to go to the mikvah, which was something I had been doing uh, since I got married, and I was quite worried about how that was gonna go. Um, and this was something that I had read a ton about, I had taught rides about preparing for mikvah, and I knew that it had the potential to be a very healing and powerful moment, and so I, with some help, decided to create a bit of a ritual around going to the mikvah. Um, and I'm very grateful to Bilishul Mikvah for being very warm and welcoming for us when we came. Uh, so very briefly, I'll just share what we did. I brought a friend and my sister, and um, before I went into the mikvah water, I read um, a small prayer that I wrote, um, basically asking, asking for the strength to forgive my body for letting this happen. And I read my song, <laughs> number 30, and we sang, um, we sang a, um, a song by Debbie Friedman, which I'm just going to read some of it because it's so beautiful. Misha Be'erach um, Avotinu, so the one that blessed our, our fathers. Mekor Habrachali Motinu, the source of rest, uh, blessing for our mothers. May the source of strength who blessed the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing. And let us say Amen. And that moment just really stands out to me because I think it could have been a moment of such intense loneliness and like just her horrible, like I was not supposed to be there with a dead baby. Um, but it wasn't. It was a moment of incredible strength and support and warmth. And 
I felt very much loved, even though there are only three other people there, one of whom was a complete stranger. Um, so that was just a very great moment for me, and I'm, I'm grateful for everybody that helped me make that happen. And uh, the last thing I want to speak about is, is my daughter's name. So it says somewhere, the rabbis will tell me where I remember, that when parents name a child, they have a hint of Ruach HaKodesh, a little bit of divine inspiration. And I've always felt that giving a name to a child is just huge. There's just a lifetime of dreams and memories and just so much in those few syllables. And it has felt very painful for all this time that we never had the opportunity to share with anyone our child's name and the reason why we named her that. So I thank you for indulging me and getting this chance to, to share with you. So the story is as follows. In um, the summer of 2014, as I'm sure you'll remember, there were three teenagers killed in Israel. Ayal Yifrach, Gilad Shar, and Aftali Frankel, they were abducted on their way home from school and murdered. And I was so upset by it. I don't know why it hit me so much, but I just, for weeks afterwards, I felt like this world is crazy and so dark and senseless, and like, I just thought it must be nuts to bring children into this world. Like, this is insane. And I don't know, eventually, I guess, the, the fog kind of lifted, and I realized that actually the only thing I can do, that I could figure out to do, was to raise children and try to teach them to be better. So that's what we tried to do. <laughs> I got pregnant right after that, and then the baby died, and I just thought, this is crazy, like how could that happen? I had all these great dreams for this child. And um, a few days after um, my gave birth, it was pouring. And in the midst of my fog, basically, I was sitting in shul listening to the Megillah and got to the line um, at the, near the end of the Megillah when everything works out. Instead of like, the deep high top, rab, the deep hot, the shafson, the ar, there was light, and gladness, and joy, and honor for the Jews. And I just knew in that moment that we would name our child Bora, which means light. I think, I think that having children is ultimately an act of radical faith. We face so many challenges in having children and in raising children, but I think we do it because we believe that ultimately tomorrow is going to be better than today. So I will end with a blessing that may we all merit the great blessing of witnessing the light that our children bring to this world. Thank you.